Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll do it one more time. Good morning, everyone. Now that the meeting is being recorded and live on YouTube, I want to, uh, my name is Erin Wortman. I'm the MAPC president, and I want to formally welcome you to the 2021 MAPC annual council meeting. I am thrilled um, that we're all here today. I am so grateful that you have chosen to spend your time here this morning. I know it's such a busy time of year, not just professionally, but personally. I know school is kind of winding down as well. So I really want to just share the sentiment that I am appreciative for each and every one of you here. So um, I'm going to just kind of ask uh, some favors today. I'm gonna ask uh, for some patience. I'm gonna ask um, in cooperation as we move forward through the meeting. Um, we have quorum, which is exciting. And thank you so much for signing in early so we're able to capture attendance. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're going to start uh, with our um, Elliott Scholarship. So I'm actually going to call on operations um, manager, um, Heidi, um, for the presentation of the Char Charles W. Elliott uh, II Scholarship. Um, and after that, I'll call the business meeting to order. We're gonna do some official business and um, get going. So Heidi, take it away. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Um, unfortunately, our uh, awardee uh, was not able to make it. I received um, notice from her earlier. She still is finishing up her classes. She was hoping to be able to pop in um, to the council meeting, but I wanted to make the announcement anyway. Um, I believe Yolanda Greaves is here from Ashland. Our awardee this year of the um, Elliott Scholarship is Ariana Sunuk of Ashland High School. Um, she is going to be attending BU in the fall in, and is going to be majoring in environmental policy and analysis and minoring in political science. Um, we will um, present her uh, at our June executive committee meeting, but I did wanna let everybody know um, that we have made the award. We had about 18 or 19 fabulous um, applications. Um, we've got some great kids out in the region and I would hope that they will come back after college and grad school or whatever they're doing and come back and work in our cities and towns and potentially at MAPC. I think it would be great. Um, thank you very much, Erin. Um, and we will move on. Thank you. Anybody has any questions, please let me know in the chat. Great. Thank you so much, Heidi, and congratulations to Ariana. Um, she is obviously incredibly impressive, and I want to congratulate her on being awarded the competitive scholarship. So thank you. So now we are going to move on to um, the business side of the meeting. So at 9.40 a.m., I am going to call the business meeting to order. I'm just gonna review the meeting technology and norms for participating and voting. Um, we did this last year. Um, if you recall, if you were a delegate or an alternate last year, we did do this last year. Um, but we're trying to, as everyone does, improve and make things more efficient as time goes on. So this open meeting of the MAPC Council is being conducted remotely consistent with the governor, uh, governor's executive order of March 12, 2020, which suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which is posted along with the agenda and MAPC's website is available at www.mapc.org backslash about slash MAPC backslash legal slash notices slash meetings 
backslash allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely. So as long reasonable access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Accordingly, the public may view the proceedings live streamed at youtube.com slash user slash MAPC Metro Boston. For this meeting, the MAPC Council is convening its members by video conference via Zoom. Uh, council members receive their login credentials when registering for the meeting. If you have not done so already, council members, and that's representatives and delegates, please rename yourselves with your full name and affiliation. So I'm Erin Wortman and I'm representing the town of Stoneham. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that most council members participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may see you. Um, the recording of this meeting and the caucuses will be posted to the MAPC website as soon as we are able to. So let's go over some meeting business ground rules. Um, we're going to be turning to the first item on the business agenda, but before we do so, permit me to cover a few ground rules for an effective and clear conduct of our business to ensure accurate meeting minutes. Please remember that your phone or cell phone should be muted unless you are asked to speak. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Finally, we will be utilizing the Zoom chat feature for all motions, seconds, and voting. We will need to be able to identify you throughout the meeting. Please ensure again that you have identified yourself and you understand how to use the Zoom chat feature and how to raise your hand. This is where the uh, patience thing, I'm going to stress again, I'm gonna do the best I can. We have a lot of people here today, but if you look at the bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen, one of the buttons should say chat, the image of a chat bubble. If you click on that, that will bring you to the chat. Again, make sure you are messaging everyone instead of the host or one of the co-hosts. If you look at the bar on the bottom of your screen, one of the buttons should say participant, outline of the person. The participants box will show up to the right when you click on that button. At the bottom right of the participants box, there will be a button to raise and lower your hands. If you're having any difficulties, please identify the problem in the chat and an MAPC staff member will assist you. Council members who must call in rather than join by video will be asked by our technical support team to identify themselves to the team. The technical staff will rename those callers. Voting by phone participants will be oral and will occur after all others have voted on a given motion. So I'm kind of done talking about all that stuff, but I just wanted to kind of share just one incredible thank you to the MAPC staff for making my job so easy and for making this meeting as smooth as possible. And of course, thank you to the participants for uh, your patience and your grace in these moments, uh, but also your participation as well. And definitely utilize that chat for sure to give those accolades as well. I see some thumbs up from people and I know staff really appreciates that. So uh, we were asked, council members and de uh, delegates were asked before count, um, as part of the invitation to um, come on early so we could take attendance um, to kind of minimize uh, the long uh, council member attendance uh, thing. But um, we do have to call the roll as required by law. So um, if we did not grab you, uh, when you checked in, almost like we check in in person, uh, we're gonna do so at this time. So if your name is not called, do not fret. We have already captured you as being here. So at this time, I'm gonna call operations manager Heidi to kind of get those uh, people that we may have missed. Heidi? Okay, thank you, President Erin. Um, we are going to start with roll call with the gubernatorial appointees. I will read the names off in alphabetical order, um, leaving out those who we've already captured as attendants. For example, Sharonda Almeida, we've already captured her. Um, I'm going to start with Lisa Browdy. If you could stay present or 
um, in the chat. So Carbonell, Kelly Chung, Gina Martinez, Matilda McKee Tubb, Steve Silvera, Romani Strip Parda, Plata, Kelly B. Strong, Monica Tibbetts Nutt, Bill Tinty, Sam Wong. Okay, we're going to move on to the ex officio members now. Um, Catherine Banesh for MBTA, Joel Barrera for Massport, John Bouchard for MassDOT Highway Division, Sean Canty from Boston Water and Sewer, Jim Montgomery, DCR, Chris Osgood, Boston Public Works Streets. And that is it for the ex officios. We've captured everybody else. We are going to move on to cities and we will do this in alphabetical order by uh, municipality. Um, the first one, Caitlin Passafaro, Boston Alt Rep. James Downey, Brain. Tony Souza Everett, Mayor Spicer, Framingham, or Thatcher Keyser, Framingham Alt, James Marsh, Lynn, Meredith Harris, Marlboro, Kurt Bellavance, Peabody, Michelle Tyler, Randolph, Mayor Curta Tone, Somerville. Catherine Cagle, Waltham. Mayor Headland, Weymouth. Austin Faison, Winthrop. Okay, that is all the cities. We were able to capture most of them in attendance. Um, we are going to start in on the towns now. We will go alphabetically by town name. And the first one is Erica Urardi Bolton. Okay. Aaron Henry Danvers. Christopher Dwelly Dover. Peter Fippen, Essex. Ann Lee, Hanover. David Allschuler, Hingham. Amy Ritterbush, Hopkinton. Christina Johnson, Hudson. Chris Diorio, Hull. Robert Dolan, Linfield. Steve Leveron, Marblehead. Chris De Silva, Maynard. Robert Weiss, Millis. James Fries, Natick. Okay, Richard McCarthy, Norfolk. Paul Halkiotis, Norwood. Okay, Harry Corslin, Rockport. Jeanette Fasano, Saugus. James Boudreau, Situate. Kevin Haratunian, Topsfield. Aaron Kokinda, Wakefield. Margaret Hoffman, Wenham. Valley Gingrich, Wilmington. And that is it for roll call.
Thank you, Heidi. And just a reminder, uh, we're only calling, we were only calling in roll call those people who were not captured when you were in the waiting room waiting to enter. So if your name was not called or your municipality or your organization wasn't called, it's because we've already counted you as present. Yep. Um, but I'm thrilled that everyone is here and uh, this is much easier than calling over a hundred names for sure. So thank you all for your help and uh, cooperation in that. So next up in the um, agenda is the approval of minutes of the Winter Council meeting for March 3rd, 2021. There is one edit. We had a double vote captured. Um, and thank you to those who read the minutes ahead of time and um, found that out. So um, the edit or the amendment uh, I'm looking for a motion with that amendment to capture that Alicia Hunt of Medford uh, voted to abstain um, in a vote um, as she described to Heidi. So at this time, oh great, thank you so much, Frank of Quincy. Um, I really appreciate that. So um, again, we're utilizing the chat uh, for voting as well as motions and seconds. So Frank uh, of Quincy, thank you for your motion. And Yolanda of Ashland, thank you for your second. At this time, if there are no questions, uh, please utilize the chat uh, at this time and vote aye if you are in favor. Erin, it looks like uh, Sandra has her hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry, Alex. That's okay. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. I have, tr I have trouble seeing that. Okay. Alexandra. Okay, thanks, Rachel. I just said oh, a Sandra. I'm sorry, Sandra. That's okay. Go ahead. A couple of name corrections. The list of names are unbelievable. Thanks to Heidi and everyone who checked on those. But there are two typos in the names. Bandana and Elaine are missing letters from their names in the first roll call list. Thank you, Sandra. So. Um, um, thank you, Sandra, and we'll consider those Scrivener's errors, so those will be incorporated with those amendments. I am seeing everyone vote. Thank you so much. And now at this time, any nays or abstentions, obviously just write um, that, please. And it looks like motion passes. And thank you, Rachel, uh, for your assistance on a technical side about the hand raised. I am still having a little issues with the hand raise option. So um, I will figure that out as we go along. But if you raise your hand and I do not see you, if you can even type in the chat, hand raise, raise hand, it's just easier for me to see. I have only one screen at my current physical setup. Um, Aaron, I can monitor that. Awesome. You. Th thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I only have one screen and I have three documents that I'm working on for the script plus uh, all of you. So, um, but thank you, Rachel. I really appreciate that. Okay, so the motion passes. Thank you so much for that. Um, next up, I'm going to call um, our treasurer, Sam, to present the report of the treasurer. So, treasurer Sam. Take it away. Uh, thank you, President Aaron. Uh, sorry for the brief delay. I'm Sam Seidel, the treasurer, and today we are going to do two items. One is renewal of the borrowing authority for FY22. Uh, and then the second is the uh, review and adoption of the FY22 budget. Uh, but why don't we start with the first item first, which is renewal of borrowing authority. Um, in the past, MAPC has occasionally borrowed funds for cash flow purposes. Uh, we have not used this authority often, uh, and we have not used it in a while, but it's, it is a prudent measure to balance against any contingencies. Uh, and it's something we do every year. And at this time, uh, I would entertain a motion to extend or continue the borrowing authority into FY22. Uh, and 
I see a motion by Frank and a second by Michelle Tyler Randolph. Um, so thank you for the two of you. And, uh, and then the order of the voting, I was, I was asked to ask for nays or abstention. No, do the, do the yays first. Okay, apologies for that. Uh, the order of the voting will be the yays or the ayes will vote first. So if you're voting aye, please vote so now in the chat. Thank you. I'm seeing the votes come in. I think it's okay now to ask for the nays or the abstentions. If you're voting no or abstaining, please vote so now in the chat. And I, it looks like the voting is complete uh, by my tally. The yeas, the ayes have it, and the motion is passed. Um, Moving on to the next item uh, today is the uh, review and, the, and then the adoption of the FY22 budget uh, that was reviewed by the executive committee on May 19th and forwarded to the full council with uh, a recommendation of approval and adoption. Um, you have received in your packet the, the summary sheet of the, the numbers for the budget. And why don't I just spend a, a minute to review those and, and then uh, we can entertain any questions or comments and then I would entertain a motion at that time. Um, you'll see on the sheet uh, that the first number I wanna draw your attention to is total internal operating expenses, which is up in this upcoming year, FY22. Uh, by 1.2 million. And let me just preface that by saying, we've all come out of the year of COVID with so many unknowns and so many questions. And MAPC addressed th those challenges very well. And now we're looking forward to this year post COVID. And I know we're not out of the woods yet, but we're, we're, we're working to get there. Uh, and this overall budget represents stability across a year of great turmoil, and, and we're hoping for a much more positive year in every sense coming up. So the first thing to note is 1.2 million uh, in additional new internal operating expenses, uh, which is always a good thing. You will note that the total uh, direct and indirect expenses, that money is down by 4.79 million, but that's because there was a lot of pass-through money in last year's budget that has actually passed through. That includes the LED streetlight program, which has been finished to completion, and then the urgent taxi grant disbursements, which also have been finished through to completion. Uh, so that's the reason for the decrease in the, in the overall uh, total revenue. Uh, what this new internal operating revenue will allow is for some new hiring. This is, a, we're now at the 30,000 foot level. It will allow for new hiring and for the continued work in all of the areas that MAPC is doing excellent work uh, and even some new areas that have emerged uh, during COVID that we can look at. Um, it's also important to note that in this budget is contained the realization, the recognition that uh, just like all of you, MAPC is thinking about and considering how to return to the office. And I think the first set of thoughts is that that will be some version of a hybrid version. I think we've all recognized there are some real benefits to online and Zoom, including increased participation and ability to do a lot of things, but there's nothing like being uh, next to somebody and just being able to review stuff uh, in person. The final takeaway uh, that I would note out of the uh, budget sheet is that the overhead rate is at 1, 1.18, 118%, which is down a, a good amount uh, from this past year of 123%. Uh, the reason for that, and that's a good thing, re reducing that overhead rate, uh, is that so much of the uncertainty, uh, we now feel we've sort of moved through that phase and into a place where we can predict uh, with a lot more precision, exactly what will happen. Kids are back in school. Uh, the need for family leave is, is reduced, greatly reduced. 
Uh, so those are those are really the highlights of the budget. Um, I'll just make a, a, a couple of points about the areas of, ex, of exciting work coming up. One is in the digital divide. It's an area that MAPC has recognized, a lot of people have recognized through COVID, and there should be uh, some very interesting work. Also the continued work in public health, which will continue uh, in this upcoming year post COVID of, of looking at uh, what happened and then how, how it worked. And then arts and culture, also appears uh, to be looking very good for this upcoming year in terms of the work going forward. Um, that concludes my summary of the budget. I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Sheila Winter and her staff uh, and the finance, the whole finance team, and also all the directors of the programs who worked very, very hard to work through these numbers, come up with real numbers. Um, the takeaway for MAPC is that it's in good shape. Uh, it always follows the practice of very prudent, uh, conservative budgeting. Uh, you know, let's be safe. And then at the mid-year, we can look at uh, how things have gone in, during the first half of the year. But th and this budget represents that again. Uh, so a great thanks to uh, everybody on the team who helped make this happen, including, of course, Rebecca Davis and Mark Drayson, but everybody else as well. And with that, I would entertain any questions or comments and uh, seeing if there are none, then a motion uh, to adopt the FY22 budget. And I see- Sam, I would only, if I could- Yes. Just extend, if I may, Treasurer Sam, extend um, my appreciation, uh, not only to Rebecca, but also to our finance director, Sheila Winter Downer, Downer uh, sorry, AH, my Boston accent, Sheila Winter Downer and our uh, assistant uh, finance director, Lourdes Alvarez, along with all the department heads who spent a great deal of time and effort preparing the budget. And if I may also to thank Sam, who as the chair of our finance committee is, is endlessly attentive to this work uh, on many of the details. Yeah. Appreciate it very much. It plays to my worst characteristics of asking 40 million questions as opposed to the 20 million I normally ask. Um, I see a motion by Yolanda Greaves, who is part of the Finance Committee. Thank you, Yolanda. And a second by Mo Handel. Um, so there's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I would ask for the I votes in the chat at this time. With the votes coming in, I think we can now ask for the, the no votes or the abstentions. If you're voting no or abstaining, please vote so now in the chat. I see the votes have slowed down. I think most have voted now and it is the view of the reporting chair that the ayes have it and the FY22 budget is adopted. I, with that, I wanna thank you all. Thanks to the whole team and I hand it back to President Aaron. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. And I definitely echo Executive Director Mark and Treasurer Sam's sentiment. Like I, I think we all know how challenging and time consuming a budget is and, and difficult, particularly when there's a lot of variables involved. So thank you so much for all your participation in that. Um, next up in the agenda is the election of officers by full council. Before I call on the nominating committee chair, I'm just going to kind of go over some election procedures just br really briefly. It is a little different than last year. I think that we have uh, evolved uh, through this like virtual platform uh, to make it, um, to share expectations, to make it more efficient and also to increase access um, for these sorts of things. So all votes um, for 
all votes, including elections, will be made in the Zoom chat feature. So all those votes are visible to all council members and are recorded. Additional nominations and seconds for any office or executive committee seat will be made in the Zoom chat feature. So they're visible to all council members and recorded. So the election of officers will go first then um, city, town, gubernatorial, and ex officio caucuses will be held to elect uh, executive committee members. Nominees for any contested position will be given the opportunity to speak. And please remember only duly appointed council representatives may vote. A city or town alternate council representative may only vote in the absence of the city or town council representative. So at this time, and just so we know, uh, for those executive committee seats, we're going to go in those uh, breakout rooms. And um, even if you're not a representative or a alternate, everyone will have access to those uh, caucus rooms, uh, so to speak, those caucus rooms, and uh, they will be available um, for review after the meeting as they are also being recorded. So at this time, I'm going to call on and recognize the chair of the nominating committee, Jenny Raitt, to lead the election of officers. Jenny? Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I am going to read to you the report of the nominating committee. The 2021 nominating committee comprised of Sharonda Almeida, gubernatorial designee, Tom Daniel from the city of Salem, Tabor Keeley from the town of Milton, myself from the town of Arlington, and Elaine Vanya, ex officio member, met on April 28, 2021, and they selected me, Jennifer Rate, as chair, and Tom Daniel as vice chair. The nominating committee reviewed the nominations for officers, and we recommend the following individuals to serve as officers of the Metropolitan Area Planning Council for terms of office to begin on May 26, 2021 and to serve until the next annual council meeting. They are as follows. For president, Aaron Wortman, town of Stoneham. For vice president, Adam Chapdelaine, town of Arlington. For treasurer, Sam Seidel, gubernatorial. And for secretary, Sandra Hackman, town of Bedford. I have no further comments to make about the report of the nominating committee. Um, thank you very much, Madam oh. President. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jenny. You're I really welcome. appreciate, um, I want to thank the nominating committee for their time and uh, their conversation over the slating process. I really appreciate that. Thank you for agreeing to being on the nominating committee. I do acknowledge that we do have a motion, a very excited motion, uh, pre-report, so thank you, Frank. But um, just at this time, I want to make sure that there are no other nominations from the floor And I have figured out how to use the hand up motion. So progress, great. I'm not seeing anything, any other nominations from the floor. Thank you, Heidi, for writing down the slate. So um, with that, I see a motion from Frank from Quincy and I'm looking for, oh, thank you, George of Somerville for the second. Um, at this time, oops, Okay, at this time, all those in favor, please type in the chat by saying aye to accept the slate um, as presented. Great. Thank you. I'm seeing the vote slow down. So any um, abstentions or um, nays may vote at this time as well. Great. Well, with that, I think the motion passes. Uh, the slate of officers have been elected. Thank you again to Jenny um, and the rest of the nominating committee. Um, I really obviously appreciate you um, putting uh, your faith in the officers to be reelected again. And I look forward uh, to the upcoming year serving one more time. Okay. Um, 
That being said, we are going to now move on to the um, election of the executive committee by individual caucuses. So we are going to have individual council members meet to elect executive committee members. Council members will be moved to our respective caucus breakout rooms. I almost said breakfast rooms, uh, breakout rooms to vote. The caucuses will be moderated by cities by um, Council Margie, Towns by um, Mark Rassacott, Ex Officio by Martin Pillsbury, and Gubernatorial uh, with Rebecca Davis with technical support staff to record the caucus caucuses and votes. Each caucus will elect five members with the one exception of cities, which will elect four as the city of Boston is a permanent member of um, the city group. I will note that the members of the public who are viewing this via YouTube, that you'll be able to view a recording of the caucuses after the meeting. If you would like to join via Zoom, we will provide the registration information in the comment section on YouTube as well. Any attendees who are not council members may request to view a caucus vote, but are reminded that you are not allowed to speak and are expected to remain muted throughout the process. They can put in the chat which caucus you would like to join if you're not automatically moved and MAPC staff will move you to the appropriate breakout room. If you choose to stay in the main room, you are invited to take a quick rest or break until we come back after the voting, hopefully no later than 1030. After the caucuses are completed, the votes will be tallied and the council members will be moved back to the main meeting. The moderators, which is that MAP staff members I just uh, spoke about, will report out the results of the caucuses. So if there are no questions, um, hopefully not, because uh, those of us who are voting are going to be magically moved by technical staff. I don't know how you do it, but just have fun doing it. And I will see you back when it's time to report out um, the outcomes of the new executive council um, leaders. Hi folks, if you have not been pulled into a breakout room at this time, uh, you uh, have not been assigned to one. Some of you may be MAPC staff waiting to help us with the remainder of the meeting. Um, and some of you may be non-council members. If you are either a council member who has not been able to join their caucus, please send a message in the chat. Um, or if you um, are a non-council member who would like to join a caucus, please also send a message in the chat. Um, thank you. Hi folks, I'm just going to make this announcement one more time. If you are a council member who has not been able to join their caucus, please send me a message in the chat as to which caucus you should be in and I will move you to the appropriate breakout room. And if you are a, a, a non-council member who would like to observe a caucus, uh, please also put in the chat which caucus you would like to join and I will move you to that respective caucus as well. Thank you.
Hi folks, just going to make this announcement one last time uh, in case folks have been in and out a little bit. Uh, if you are a council member who should be in a caucus breakout right now and you are not, please let me know uh, what breakout caucus uh, you should be in and I will move you to the respective room. If you are a non-council member who would like to observe a caucus breakout room, uh, you can uh, put a message in the chat as to which caucus you would like to join um, and I will move you there. Great, and I, I hear we already have one. Uh, uh, towns are, are done. Looks like all of our it looks like all of our breakouts are done. So I'm going to close the rooms. And we should have everybody back within the next minute. All right, welcome back folks. We'll be continuing shortly uh, with the uh, main meeting. So thank you for bearing with us. Welcome back everyone. What an efficient um, voting we had. Uh, it definitely went quicker than if we were in person. Um, I'm not sure what that says about us um, as chatty folks, but at this time, oh, okay. At this time, um, I am going to, you can see in the chat who, ha who was elected in each um, caucus. And thank you so much. So I wanna take a quick second to congratulate all um, the gubernatorial ex officio city. And I did it in our town breakout, but town executive committee members. Um, thank you so much uh, for stepping up or re-upping. Um, I look forward to working with all of you this year as we meet as an executive committee. Um, and I'm thrilled uh, that you have chosen um, to serve. So thank you so much for that. And thank you to staff for running those breakout rooms. Um, and thank you uh, to staff as well for putting in the chat who won. So um, once those are all um, inputted into the chat, please uh, take a moment to um, congratulate each other on that. So thank you again. So next up is the report of the executive director, Mark. How is your um, connection? Are you ready to report? Well, I'm ready to report, but I'm wondering if Sasha can uh, indicate to me whether I can be heard clearly. I hear you. Yes. Okay, very good. 
My connection seems to be okay, although I'm seeing virtually no video. Um, I'm not sure if that's an indication of an unstable connection, but let me give it a try. Can you still hear me? Yes. You can. Okay. All right. Well, we'll give this a try and hopefully it will work out. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you, uh, President Aaron. Uh, congratulations to all the members of the executive committee. I do want to thank Jenny for chairing the nominating committee and Sam for making our presentation of the budget. A huge amount of work goes into the budget and then we spend 10 minutes talking about it. It seems very simple, but in fact, it's a very complicated process. And uh, I feel that our financial stability is largely as a result of all the work that goes into that effort. Um, I want to start with a big smile and a and a virtual hug to everyone who's here. I feel blessed to be with you, uh, to be entering uh, a spring that is a hopeful time, uh, to see us beginning to see each other more, uh, interact with each other more, and try and, uh, and see if we can return to a more normal uh, way of life. Uh, at the same time, I have a few serious things that I'd like to talk to you about. It's sort of in the midst of that joy and pleasure. Uh, one of those is that we still have to try and make sure that our population in this region throughout the Commonwealth, throughout the country and the world is vaccinated. And we have a very long way to go in that. One of the things that MAPC continues to work on day in and day out is the question of vaccine availability, uh, vaccine communications, and vaccine uptake throughout our region. Uh, we've seen a lot of inequity in the actual rates of vaccination. Uh, we continue to see in some of our poorest, most low-income communities, communities with essential workers, communities where people might, in some cases, not be completely trusting of the vaccine, but also uh, people may have difficulty getting time off from work to go get a vaccine or to deal with the, uh, the fact that they may be sick for the next couple of days. Uh, and we are working very hard uh, especially in the communities north of Boston, but also in other communities throughout the region to try and redress that issue and get as many people vaccinated as possible. It's absolutely critical. Uh, it's critical from the perspective of variants. It's critical from the perspective of returning everyone to school in the fall. It's critical from the perspective of making sure that essential workers can be safe. And it's a critical element of trying to restore equity in the region. Uh, the the efforts that we are undergoing in that regard are often connected with our North Suffolk Health Collaborative and with the uh, Metro North Regional Collaborative, which we really helped to put together. Rebecca, Mark Fine, Barry Keppard, all very active with those two collaboratives. And I just want to say that for MAPC, the vaccine efforts continue. They haven't ended yet. Uh, a second issue that we're working on that's really critically important and op offers a great deal of opportunity to us is the passage uh, and now the expenditure of the funds that come from ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act. As the president has indicated, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to apply some funds and do some things that we've always said we wanted to do, but haven't had the resources or the time or the focus to do. And uh, I wanna thank Lizzie Wyant, uh, our government affairs chief, who has really helped us to understand the extremely complicated details of this program, including 151 pages of draft treasury regs. Uh, but we all know that this is a great opportunity. $5.3 billion coming to the state, $3.4 billion coming to communities, to individual municipalities, either directly from the state or uh, from counties. Uh, and even though we know that some of those monies are likely to be used to fill in for lost revenue that the Commonwealth or the municipalities may have because of COVID, even though we know that some of them are going to be applied to some really important big ticket items, like making whole the unemployment trust fund, which is extremely important for our future, uh, there will still be a dramatic amount of resources available. And we at MAPC are eager to work with the Commonwealth, both the administration and the legislature, to try and make sure that the state funds are applied as effectively and quickly as possible. We're working with individual communities uh, and groups of communities to establish projects using their own monies, the monies that municipalities get directly. 
Uh, we also realize that there are more restricted parts of the state funds as well that go for public health or go for education. And we're working with communities in many cases to help them apply for those additional funds. Whichever role we take, we are trying to emphasize the issue of equity above all other issues. Uh, it has become trite to say that the pandemic unveiled inequities that were long present in our society. We all know that. But it is important to keep the details in mind. It's important to understand what this has meant in black and brown communities that saw much higher rates of infection and death than other communities. It's important to remember what it meant in terms of vast numbers of women leaving the workforce, far more than men, and now rejoining much more slowly. It's important to remember, often not discuss the impact this has had on people with disabilities. And the list goes on and on. We don't want the new normal to just be the old normal that we had before the pandemic. We want our society to be a more equitable one, more just, more filled with opportunity for everybody. And ARPA provides us a set of tools to begin to make this happen. Some big steps or some small steps, it's important to take those steps. And I ask all of the state agencies present here today and all of the representatives of cities and towns, when you're thinking about how to spend this money, think about the issue of equity. If you're planning to do a project that might not be equity focused, is there a way to make it more equity focused? If you haven't decided yet what projects you wanna choose, can you select those that are focused on issues of equity and will have a real impact? And this is possible across top areas, and it's also possible across communities. There are ways to focus on equity, on inclusion, on creating a really new normal in all 101 of our communities, regardless of their current demographic characteristics. And we at MAPC, as always, are ready to work with you on this and to try and help the use of ARPA funds to be successful. I've been asked by our economic development staff to make a particular plug for the additional resources that have come to the Economic Development Administration of the U.S. Department of Commerce. As many of you know, we are the Economic Development District, uh, which is a designation that, that is applied to MAPC by EDA. And that requires us to develop the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, the SEDS, which our executive committee just approved a few months ago. But it also gives us a front row seat at helping to vet and distribute funds for actual projects to cities, towns, nonprofits, corporations, and others. And there is a lot of additional money available at EDA, not just for planning, some of which we have, but also for projects. And please contact Betsy Cowan or Raul Gonzalez in our Economic Development Division. Find out about these, these, these funds that are available and think of ways to perhaps combine them with ARPA funds or just separately to uh, create a project that you might have a real opportunity to use these funds to do something you've been thinking of doing, but haven't had the resources to do in the past. The last thing I wanna close with is a question of reflection. Uh, you know, I know that a lot of us have been through a very tough year. For local officials, especially, this has been a difficult and traumatic time. Uh, you've been on the front lines. You've been struggling to deal with things that maybe you weren't particularly prepared to deal with or didn't think you'd have to deal with in your career or in your office. And sometimes you've got the brunt of the blame when things didn't go right. We all know that's sort of the fate of local government. As we look forward uh, with joy and anticipation, we at MAPC feel it's important to look back as, as well. We will be doing this, We're also calling upon the legislature to establish a commission to look into the COVID pandemic. And we encourage municipal governments and state agencies also to do this on their own. We have to ask ourselves, the answer is usually no in this case. We also have to ask ourselves, what are the, some of the incredible things that we did that we would want to do in the future? And there are huge numbers of things that fall into that category because we responded very well in many respects. And lastly, we have to ask ourselves, what will we do differently? There will be future pandemics. There will be future disasters. The best way we can remember the people we lost in the last year is to reflect upon what we did well and what we did not so well as a lesson for the future, a distribution of blame, learning. So the next time around, we can do things better for all of us. I wanna thank you. I wanna say,
and we're looking forward to some really great times ahead. Thank you so much. Turning, turning it back over to you, Erin. Thank you, Mark, uh, for those uh, great insightful words. And I think uh, I, I couldn't be the only one that was nodding along on uh, all the various topics that you covered. Um, so thank you for that. So getting, um, we're moving on to our next point um, in the agenda. And I'm gonna call on uh, one of the co-directors of uh, the Strategic Initiatives Department at MEPC, uh, Eric Hove, to open the presentation on Metro Common 2050. Eric? Thank you, uh, Aaron, and thanks everybody. Nice to see you this morning. Um, I'm joined uh, in doing this presentation by the other co-director, uh, Emily Torres Cullinane as well. But let me uh, pull up my screen to share. And uh, before I begin, I uh, just wanna let you know where we're at in the process of uh, updating our regional plan, Metro Common. Um, we are in the last couple of months of finalizing the plan. Um, right now, we're in Metro Common May, where the uh, recommendations, the draft recommendations are out for public comment. So we encourage everyone to take a look at those. They're actually in survey form uh, on metrocommon.org. And uh, our plan is to come back to the council in early fall, uh, seeking your uh, adoption of the plan. So we have a busy summer ahead, but uh, we are close to the end. Um, before I jump in, I just wanted to thank the Metro Common team at MAPC for developing the content that I'm drawing from today, and especially uh, Kit Un and our communications team for making the presentation uh, look so great. Um, today, I'm just going to describe a little bit of um, where we want the region to be in 2050. Uh, this was really the result of the work we did over the first year of the planning process, um, asking people what future they imagine. Um, oh. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we know about the future and what we don't know about the future. And this work really comes from Sarah Philbrick and Data Services and her team um, with the scenario work. Um, we're going to end uh, looking at things that we should do really no matter what happens in the future. Um, you know, just robust actions that are going to be uh, help us succeed no matter what. And then talk about some of the immediate next steps we can do to help build uh, a successful recovery. And Emily is then going to take over and talk about our implementation efforts and um, tee us up for a conversation um, in breakouts about equitable recovery and people's priorities for, for implementation. So like I said, in the first year, uh, we really spent uh, that time uh, asking people for their vision of the future. Uh, we came up with uh, 10 aspirational goals uh, that really describe that future that we all want to share uh, for, for Greater Boston. And like Mark said, uh, right now, we do have a once in a generation opportunity uh, to make some investments on the scale of $8.7 billion uh, to get us uh, back on that path to make sure we can actually achieve those goals for, for the long-term future of the region. And just a reminder, uh, no matter what happens, we do have the agency as the region to figure out the future that we want. Um, as long as we work together, uh, we can actually make this happen. Um, starting out uh, in year two of the planning process, um, we, we really focused in on the major challenges and opportunities uh, that uh, stand in our way um, that we're going to have to deal with and really take on head on uh, to accomplish our goals. I want to share some of the main uh, highlights from, from that uh, part of the planning process. No surprise here, but uh, the, the, many of the challenges we face are regional and interconnected. Things don't stop at the municipal borders, whether it's housing, the economy, the environment, or transportation. These are all regional issues. We know it's difficult to collaborate in terms of how we're structured uh, here in Eastern Mass, really across the Commonwealth. Um, collaboration's hard, but uh, despite that, uh, in this last year, because of the pandemic, we really did see unprecedented levels of collaboration. Uh, despite that, uh, th that uh, growing partnership, uh, it's still difficult when there is a disconnect between state decisions and priorities with what's happening locally and what those local needs are. 
And also, no surprise, the, the time and financial skills that we're looking at, whether it's on affordable housing, infrastructure, transportation, and social supports are just staggering in terms of the investments that are needed. And the time uh, to make these investments uh, really is short. We also spent a lot of time looking at the history of exclusion and oppression um, that continues today, um, really leading us to the disparities that we see by race and income and wealth um, that are continuing. And many of these uh, disparities um, are continuing to widen today. We also have a disconnect between market forces and price signals uh, with our long-term um, benefits um, because of subsidies and externalities, we don't really pay for the full cost of our actions. And it's often the case that doing the right thing is more expensive, at least in the short term. And finally, this is another trend we've been seeing for some time now that we have been losing um, the middle income households and middle income occupations and really turning into a really bifurcated region where uh, there are some uh, with great amounts of wealth and, and comfort, whereas many are just really struggling to get by. Moving into what we know about the future, or at least we are pretty sure we, we know about the future, um, we did run six different um, population and economic uh, growth scenarios uh, over the long term. Um, they're listed here, and uh, you know, really, regardless of which scenario comes to bear, um, we are going to continue to see uh, a strong need for for new housing um, creation over the long term. Um, just roughly on the order of a quarter million uh, new homes are, are likely to be needed over the next thirty years. Uh, we are an aging region. Um, the, the population of uh, individuals over the age of seventy is likely to double um, over those over that time frame. And our continued growth is going to continue to rely on on international immigration to really fuel fuel the growth in our in our region. We know climate change impacts are going to continue to pose increasing threats um, and the impacts will worsen uh, with time. And we also know that technology is going to keep evolving, uh, affecting our jobs, our lives. You know, two years ago, I never even heard what Zoom was, and now my life is all about Zoom. We also know that the future will be unpredictable. And as planners, as municipal and state leaders, as nonprofit leaders, uh, we have to embrace uh, that uncertainty and really be agile and adaptable in how we adapt our policies and programs to confront that future uh, uncertainties uh, when they occur. Now I'm going to talk just briefly about some of the things we don't know about the future. Um, and I should say we have uh, issued a number of reports uh, and research uh, products uh, related to these. So, so uh, please do visit metrocommon.org and mapc.org uh, for some more details on these. Um, number one, we don't know what the future of federal support is likely to be. Uh, will it be feast or will it be famine? And what, or will it keep going back and forth like we've experienced over the last few years? And what implications does that have uh, for local and state and regional response? We don't know just how bad in the precise timing and location of the impacts of climate change. And transportation technology and demand, uh, you know, will, will the commuting patterns and work from home that many of us have experienced uh, over the last year continue? Will it just be a flash in the pan? And what, how will this change over time as new technologies come on and become adopted uh, really throughout Eastern Massachusetts? We also don't know uh, with any precision what uh, the future holds in terms of the contours of our regional population and economic growth. In a recent report we issued on e-commerce uh, looks at uh, the growing um, industry of home delivery and retail and what those impacts are likely to be on bricks and mortar retail and commercial uh, industry. And now this brings us to uh, the point of, even though there's lots we don't know, um, there are a number of actions that we believe will help us succeed in reaching our goals, really no matter what the future holds. 
And these are the guiding principles of the Metro Common Plan. And these actions really fit under uh, within these principles. And I should mention on the prosperity one, uh, this really is focused on prosperity for all. It's making sure that everybody benefits in, in the wealth and, uh, and innovation of our, of our economy. Number one, uh, equity is really the superior development model, one that we should be focusing on and, and making central in all of our work. Two, without nature, we are indeed lost. This will be even more critical with the changing climate and the impacts that are, are ahead. Again, as we saw this year, local governments are fundamental actors in so many parts of our life. Um, making sure they have the support and capacity to carry out their mission is really fundamental to achieving our goals. And as, as a metropolitan region, our future success depends on investing in both cities and suburbs, making sure there are opportunity in both because one really cannot succeed without the other. And as a land use and transportation agency, we know these things must be better coordinated. Uh, with the new passage of the MBTA Communities Bill um, now into law, I think this is a great opportunity to really uh, begin to better coordinate investments in land use, uh, along with investments in service uh, expansions and restoration in transportation. I hate to say it as a someone who loves driving, but uh, cars are not going to be the long term solution to our to, to our uh, transportation. There's just not enough space, not enough roads for us to all drive to where we need to get. And regardless of which future unfolds, we are going to continue to need more housing, especially affordable housing and housing that works for folks uh, in the later stages of life. And again, another issue that is not going away anytime soon is the displacement pressures that we're seeing in certain neighborhoods and certain uh, communities. In hot markets, we're going to need much stronger interventions in order to protect existing residents and local uh, small businesses. We also know that we need to rapidly transition to an electric future. We, the time to act is really in the next, within the next five years if we're going to accomplish our 2030 and 2050 greenhouse gas uh, goals. And even with that transition, uh, smart growth and equity needs to continue to guide uh, where and how we grow uh, to, in order to meet our equity and climate goals. And infrastructure and our built environment is going to need to be resilient, able to bounce back from the, from the impacts of climate change. And, and related to that is our public health infrastructure, as Mark mentioned earlier. Um, we need to continue to invest in that over the long term, including disaster preparedness and planning. We know there will be future disasters, so let's make sure that we're actually uh, able and capable in terms of responding. So what can we do today? What lessons have we learned or think we've learned in the last year? What short-term actions can lead to an equitable and resilient recovery and put us on the path, path towards meeting those 2050 goals? And what really can we do with $8.7 billion Let's not just keep doing what we've always done. It's time to really invest in, a, in an equitable and resilient recovery. And let's lead with equity. Let's start, start at the root causes. Let's look for solutions that advance multiple goals at once. Things like equitable transit-oriented development and walkable neighborhoods, workforce that looks at climate and job, job growth opportunities in, in well-paying careers. We need a 21st century bus service, one that's frequent, convenient, reliable, and affordable. And we need to enact tenant protections and expand generation access to, to home ownership for first generation and first time home buyers. We need to invest in the arts. We need to close that digital divide. And we need to move towards more progressive and reliable revenue sources over, over the long term. And finally, we need to continue to invest in the local and regional public health infrastructure to make sure we are prepared for what, what's ahead. I'm now going to turn it over to Emily, who's going to talk through some of the implementation approaches that uh, we've been working on and would love to hear your feedback on. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, that was wonderful. And now we get to the fun part. How do we actually get this good work done? 
So about four years ago, even before planning for Metro Common, we asked you what were some of the things that you wanted to see um, in Metro Common, but really we were talking about implementation before the plan was done. So I'm gonna share with you some of the things that we've been talking about, and then we wanna hear further from you. Is there anything that we missed and how do we implement Metro Common when we get to the breakouts? Next slide. We know that MAPC can't implement Metro Common um, on our own. Next slide, yeah. Uh, uh, change comes from all forms of government, from state to the local level and collaborations throughout. Next slide. We want to develop positive partnerships. Um, if you take a look at our Metro Common Advisory Committee, it is made, uh, made up of a cross sector of actors. We wanna support each other's missions and make sure that the partnerships are a two way street. Next slide. We wanna have inclusive and equitable engagement. We wanna do organizing and have advocacy efforts that support decision-making. We wanna empower people to participate. Next slide. Overwhelmingly, four years ago, when we asked you what could be useful tools for implementation, we heard research, we heard data, and especially decision support tools um, and analysis. Next slide. Uh, storytelling was also something that you talked to us about. Uh, and we all know storytelling isn't new. We know the benefits, and it doesn't actually come as easily to all of us. It's a talent and a skill, so we want to invest on creative ways to connect with people. Today, we are unveiling one of the five artistic pieces that we commissioned for Metro Common, uh, at Metro Common's action areas. We'll be showcasing it um, right now, so I'm gonna pass the microphone actually to our senior communication strategist that has been overseeing this initiative, Karen Edelman, so we can do a sneak peek of one of these um, one of these artistic pieces. Karen? Thank you, Emily, very much. Um, so as Emily said, when we asked uh, stakeholders, including many of you and including in great depth, what they needed in Metro Common, we heard tools. And we also heard communications tools because although all of us are you know, deep municipal nerds and are always soaking in all of the details of the kinds of principles and implementation strategies that, um, that we talk about on a daily basis, there are a lot of constituents who are not, and frankly, a lot of decision makers who are not as conversant with what we talk about um, even in this deck than we are. So um, we developed uh, artistic renditions, as Emily mentioned, of our five action areas. And the action areas are really the sort of entry level explanations of our the issues that we deal with, our worldview, and the interconnections between the issues we deal with. So this first one that we are looking forward to showing you in just one second um, is a film made by Mariona Loretta, um, who's a wonderful filmmaker. And this will be linked on our website and very prominent in the plan and it's really for your use with your constituents as you see fit. So please tell us what you think and please make free with it and use it, use it as much as you can. With that, please hit go. Eric, I think you just need to unmute. <laughs> Do you, mean if, do you mind if we stop it and start it over with the sound? Because the sound's really important. I don't know about others, I still can't hear the sound.
Greater Boston is growing both in jobs and population. While these changes have helped our economy and our communities, we haven't added the homes these workers and residents need. The housing shortage means housing costs are so high that many people can't afford to live here. Many residents have to make difficult choices between rent and other basic needs like medicine and food. Displacement, overcrowding, and homelessness are on the rise. Residents who have been historically excluded from certain housing markets and neighborhoods, especially people of color and those with lower incomes, face an unfair risk of displacement from their homes and communities. Et le risque augmente maintenant pour les ménages à revenus modérés et moyens, qui ont aussi euh, beaucoup de mal à se loger dans plusieurs de ces mêmes quartiers. Au cours de la dernière décennie, par exemple, euh, il y a eu une augmentation de 27% du nombre de familles sans abri dans le Grand Boston. Entonces, ¿por qué no creamos más hogares para la gente? Hay un número limitado de terrenos sin desarrollar en la región. Y en muchas ciudades y pueblos se impide el uso de terrenos para el desarrollo multifamiliar y otras alternativas a las viviendas unifamiliares. В результате того, как устроены местные зонирования, период застройки затягивается и зачастую становится неопределенным временем. В результате многие проекты не могут быть закончены и вынуждены быть замороженными. Ces caractéristiques rendent le logement coûteux à développer, à acheter ou même à louer. Et peu d'endroits, en fait, nécessitent des aménagements pour inclure des logements abordables pour ces ménages à revenus faibles ou moyens. We need change so everyone has the opportunity to live and contribute to vibrant neighborhoods. Si tamken an nas men al aish bal qarab men amakin alayhum andama yatanasib taqlahum ma ijarat al manazil fi nafs al mantaka. As pessoas fazem menos viagens de veículos quando moram perto de lojas, empregos e parques, reduzindo as emissões que contribuem para as mudanças climáticas. La gente pasa menos tiempo viajando entre sus casas y el trabajo, lo que les permite pasar más tiempo en su comunidad. We dream of a greater Boston where no one is steered toward or away from any community because of their income, race, ethnicity, faith, or ability. We dream of a greater Boston where all residents have homes that meet their needs and that they can afford, in places where they're connected to jobs, services, transit, and other opportunities that offer a safe and healthy life. Help us make Boston a thriving home for everyone. I am home. I am home. Je suis chez moi. Estoy en casa. I am home. In Cambridge. In Braintree. In Natick. In Norwood. In Quincy. In Somerville. In Milford. In Mount, in Lexington, at Beverly, in Dorchester, in Stoneham, Framingham, in Roxburgh, in Hanover. I am home in Boston. Thank you um, to everyone who was involved in the creation of this piece. Thank you, Karen, for your leadership um, and all the artistic pieces and sort of your marketing mind that you talked to us about. Um, it was a very sweet piece. And if you enjoyed this, please, please watch the short film Living Together. It is 18 minutes. Um, and I know Sasha was going to be putting in um, links for you all to enjoy those. And as Karen said, 
these are yours. So if you want to share them, please do. Um, and please, please give us some feedback when you have a moment. All right, so we are going to continue on here. Two more points and then we can get into small breakouts. Um, next slide, please. All right, so another piece of feedback that we heard from you was around having our next regional plan be nimble and adaptive and the importance of measuring and monitoring progress continuously so that strategies have the ability to shift no matter what comes our way. Next slide. And lastly, but very importantly, we need to celebrate. It's important to know when we've hit the, those important milestones and celebrate and also acknowledge all the people it took to see these efforts through. I'm really hoping for a big party in the fall with all of you. What do you think, Mark and Rebecca? All right, last slide. So our questions for you today are how do we keep this momentum going? How do we implement? How do we get all of this work done? How do we proceed with purpose and have tangible impacts in the implementation of our next regional plan? What are upcoming opportunities to take advantage of? And I think I'll be the fourth person to say, uh, we have this once in a lifetime opportunity to use these resources that are coming our way. How do we use these resources, not only for recovery, but also for investing in the future? So it's your turn. We have about 25 minutes um, to get into small breakouts. These breakouts are really important to us. We really wanna hear what you have to say, whether it be about ARPA and how to use these funds or any other sort of notes um, and comments on implementation of the regional plan. So Sasha, I believe, is gonna be putting us into small breakouts. You'll have MAPC staff facilitating and note-taking, and then we'll come back here to close out the morning. Thank you all.